Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for this another live Select Technology webinar. We're going to be covering cyber security today. It's, we're going to chat about all the tips and tricks to help the individual and their security. We're going to chat about how the organization security is important. We're also going to litter it with lots of stories from around the world, news articles. So that'll be great fun. Hopefully we're all prepared and everybody's got tea, popcorn and all those little bits ready. Um, I'm today joined by Russell Gower Leach, our technical solutions architect and cyber security geek, who's currently popped on his anonymous mask for a bit of fun. To protect my identity, yeah. <laughs> There we go. I see Russell there. How are you doing, Russell? Not bad, not bad. I'm missing out on the popcorn. Where, where, where did this happen? Um, I, I've made it, but COVID has meant that I just can't get it to you. <laughs> Damn you, 2020. Exactly. I'm not going to maintain that for the, the entire talk, so we'll, we'll lose that. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you know, we're going to crack on. Russell, before we get into all the secure security elements and all of that, I wanted to bring up something that I saw on your LinkedIn post hmm. a few weeks back. You are now in the top 50 in the UK for Try Hack Me. Mm -hmm. and I found that interesting, but I'm guessing there are going to be people out there who don't know what Try Hack Me is all about. They'll work out what the top 50 in the UK means, but what's, what's Try Hack Me? Uh, it's, it's a kind of learning platform. So uh, for people who are interested in cybersecurity or, or pen testing kind of specifically, um, there are platforms out there. Track me is one of them and they are my favourite. Feel free to sponsor. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it just helps people kind of learn about the probably the, the hacker mindset, I think is where I find it useful. So understanding how um, systems and, and processes are, are looked at from, from the attacker's point of view. And also, it's, it's, it's fun learning. I mean, it sounds a bit, it does sound geeky, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I, I have discovered I do enjoy learning new things. And the challenges in the, they have, they call them rooms in other platforms, they could be just called challenges or, or boxes and things. Um, but it's kind of like playing a game. You're, you're working out a puzzle. You're, you're being given some information, and now you've got to get through to this next piece, defeat this thing and get to the next level. And I've always, always kind of liked to challenge and, and, and yeah, like to learn something new. And it has, it's taught me quite a lot of stuff. Um, I do wonder what it's pushed out, but yeah. <laughs> we'll so is it the challenges they're giving you? Are they a bit like real world challenges that hackers are actually actually doing essentially? Yeah, yes and no. So some of it is is kind of modeled after realistic things. So there'll be things like using Eternal Blue um, as, a, as an exploit. If you know anything about um, or you ever heard the name, Eternal Blue was um, a, an exploit that the NSA discovered in Windows and they, they kind of kept it themselves to help them get into other systems for, for reconnaissance and other bits and pieces. Um, they did it leak in 2017 and it pretty much fueled WannaCry and not Petya. So um, we're probably going to get into this a bit later on, but um, in in cybersecurity, there is a, there are communities or in fact, we're all part of a community. Um, so people will look out for what type of exploits and what vulnerabilities have, have come about, how people are breaking into things, and they'll learn from that and incorporate it into to what they're doing. So, I mean, um, I think it's fairly well established that WannaCry was done by North Korea. So they, they saw this exploit and they weaponized it and then made not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but they caused an awful lot of destruction in, as a consequence um, using it. And that's fairly, fairly common. You know, you're always gonna learn from what your, your peers are doing to a degree. And similarly, again, we'll, we'll probably come on this later on, that uh, when we think about cybersecurity for individuals and businesses, they need to go hand in hand because sure. one will benefit the other. That's really cool. So you've managed to do quite well on Trihack Me then and it proves that you are our, the right person to be here as a guest, essentially. <laughs> it, it, I'm in the top 50 for the, in the current month. I mean, uh, yeah, there are people who with a lot more skills than me, um, so I, I won't. It's not an ego thing there. Um, ah, no, it's, it's, putting it's, yourself, it's, you're putting yourself down there, Russ. It, it's a good platform. I encourage people who are interested to check it out. Um, Hack the Box is another popular one. 
it's a little bit more more hardcore. You, it's not quite as accessible for people who are uh, new to the, um, to the, the to the scene. So, but yeah, feel free to go and check them out. Oh, that's cool. Um, so let's 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 move back to what everybody's really here about. You know, they want to learn about what's happening in the security world. They want to know about how to protect themselves. Uh, I think it's a good starting place. Is you know, what major developments are happening in the security sphere? Because I know this month is Cybersecurity Month, and coincidentally, we are doing this webinar. <laughs> funny enough, um, and, I, and, and when I was reading about it, and that was talking about community and that concept of community, like you've just mentioned in the whole try hack me. That's part of community, and everything's part of community. So let's. So what's happening in that community? What's developing? Are there what? It's, it's an in, sorry, it's an interesting one because in, in terms of the kind of the, the advice that's kind of given out, I mean, the, the whole point of cyber security awareness is to, is to get people thinking. I think security is one of those things that tends to be the last thing you kind of think about because um, it's probably an aggro, you know, that there is yeah. there are layers that are being added to what I'm trying to do, which is making life more difficult for me from a business point of view, it's probably eating into my bottom line. I mean, it, it, it's quite a negative way of looking at it. But yes, the security doesn't doesn't generally get the uh, the attention it probably needs and deserves. So I think the whole point of, of these awareness months is to actually give you some time to to take a little little look and reflect. Um, now might be a good opportunity to take a look at your password habits. If you're using a password manager, have a little look through there. Have you got any rubbish passwords that want sorting? Are you sharing any passwords? And you really kind of shouldn't. And we can probably cover some more of that um, in a bit. Um, and yeah, just have an opportunity to, to think about these things. And one of the the interesting kind of community based uh, concepts, I, I think, is um, that when you protect yourself, you protect those around you. Um, so I think you and I talked about this the other day. If uh, if you're on some sort of social media platform or messaging platform and you get uh, kind of a news feed crop up, look at what so and so has said this week, click the link. If it's from some random person, you're not likely to click it really, are you? There are some that do, which is why these, these schemes kind of work, but more often than not, you're not going to click on the thing. If that comes from somebody that you know, somebody within your circle, you're far more likely to click on it. Your, uh, your guard is down. So there is some value in that if you protect yourself, you stop your own um, accounts and, and presences being misused to, to affect others. Well, yeah, that's actually true, because I mean, if your family member gets hacked, and they send you a message, you are more likely to click on that link that they might send you. You might think it's completely valid, but to be fair, a lot of the criminals are very poor at, you know, sending that message and making it look realistic at all. <laughs> but you are right, actually. The, well, go on. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you do have a family, you know, if you do see it from somebody you know, you are more likely to click on it. Um, how how can the individual what what tricks and things could they be doing to protect themselves then well it, it, again it's a lot of the, the, the kind of old fashioned advice and it's an interesting um comment you make that, that you know sometimes these messages are blatantly obvious and the, the grammar's terrible and stuff like that there are kind of tiers of of, of skill um a lot of the the kind of serious cyber crime are organised crimes, and they are renting out their, their platforms. You know, that people will pay them a subscription, kind of like Office 365, to have access to tools and campaigns to go and target people. Um, and one thing to bear in mind is that these are just numbers. You know, they will they will purchase huge, great lists of email addresses and sometimes passwords, and just just kind of scatter gun, see what they'll they'll get back out of it. If you actually get somebody who's kind of got a bite, you know, they've they've actually found um, some sort of entry point that works they will probably do a bit a lot more recon try and get an idea on um what who you kind of communicate with and how you communicate i mean at the end of the day um a skilled human being um, is, is is quite a, a fearsome foe and it, it does come down to what are you doing to protect the access to your accounts so things like having strong passwords is a really obvious one and one that gets touted quite a bit um but i think there is there's certainly some misconception of what, what considered a strong password because the, the, the rules have changed slightly. 
cast your mind back um yeah five years or more it used to be a case of you need to make your password complex chuck in some numbers and special characters and bits and pieces that, that'll do um and it's taken quite a while for actually the kind of the rest of the industry um, in terms of all industries to catch up on you go to our website now and they all will ask you to put in a decent password and they'll try and validate some of the content in the password you're choosing to give you the little green ticks and say yep yeah, that's a strong yeah. password you know in the early days when the, when the device was coming out those platforms weren't doing that you could set the world's crappiest password and it'd be fine um but as a but it, on the other on the flip side of it as time's progressed the ability for for attackers to crack passwords uh, or just in fact gather your password from somewhere else they don't necessarily need to crack it if they can find that you've used the same password elsewhere um has increased so now the the, the advice is actually go for a longer password the longer you go uh, for in password length, the, the, the more secure your account is, the longer it will take to actually churn through and break it. Um, the challenge with that is, I was doing this the other day, I was signing up to um, into a website and the, the strongest, longest password length it wanted was, was 12 characters and that's that's fine, that's still considered quite a long password to, to break into, but you know the current advice is actually go longer than that. Really? What, yeah. So, so what, what is, is important? <laughs> not just numbers characters and everything like that but actual well, letters that's the, the, the kind of the problem so people are predictable uh, in many respects um and we're predictable for, for our own sake for, for the, our own convenience and simplicity um if i said to you you need to set a, a a complex password chances are you're going to set a capital letter at the beginning yeah punctuation at the end <laughs> and you're going to substitute certain letters for numbers or possibly symbols because that's the way, certainly in the English language, we structure the way we write and we read. So it's it's ingrained and that makes it a bit more memorable for us to do. But it also makes us predictable. So there is plenty of cracking software out there that can help manipulate um, passwords. So if you uh, take a dictionary type um, list, of, list of words, yeah. you can tell the software to interpret, add in what's referred to as leet speak. So it substitutes the letters for numbers, add in special characters. We know that um, maybe the the target we're after their convention is a word and then a, a four digit number at the end and it can pre-build up a list of passwords for you um, rather than you having to, to, to kind of gather them or, or break them um, and then it will churn through and that's actually one of the other kind of interesting points is I talk about password cracking the if your password does get out there in, into the into the wild what tends to happen with certainly with public um, data breaches that if we want to kind of backtrack slightly on this um a lot of the a lot of the password breaches that occur out out in the world come from big names um yeah. so in the last what 10 years sony have been hacked nintendo facebook every other week um they've got a pretty appalling track record um but you name it these big names will, will get targeted because they hold a lot of data and when the bad guys get in and get um get passwords what they actually get is what's referred to as a hash um, at the hash is the encrypted version of your password. It's never, it should never be stored in plain text. Again, I think Facebook have been, been caught storing them in plain text long ago, but anyway. Um, so what they then have to do is break this hash. And in order to do that, they need to be able to kind of run through all the different variants and calculations with their, their cracking rig. And if the, the word actually isn't in their list, it still can't break it. Um, but like I say, some of this software can just do randomly generated passwords and over a long enough timeline it will eventually get it it's all about how long are they willing to commit to, to getting into this one account so you make it as hard you make it as tough as possible so that the pay how long it takes to get through the password just means it's just not worth it for them absolutely yeah there's always going to be someone who's who's done a worse job than you kind of thing that's a terrible <laughs> way of looking at it but think about um that herd mentality when when a lion goes after a, a gazelle he doesn't pick off the one at the front he picks off the one at the back so yeah. <laughs> that's a, a, a quite a terrible way i suppose of looking at cyber security <laughs> you don't need to be perfect but you need to be better than the rest of the herd or most of the herd to to avoid being picked off and the better you are the faster the lion's got to run <laughs> Oh, you say that we're improving password, but there's got to be other things that we can be doing as individuals. That so I, I know we've, we've, I know you men mention um, MFA all the time <laughs> internally. But tattooed, but, yes. <laughs> you've got yeah, right arm. Do you know what's funny is only a few weeks back, my seven-year-old, as part of his learning at school and education at school, they're actually talking about 
security um, password security. I mean, it's, he's seven years old. He's not got that many accounts. That, but weirdly, he does have accounts for whatever is you know times table rock stars has got a password to it now he's got passwords that he actually now has to manage himself but he was learning about security about how to make them complex and he could see like typing in i think his his password was something like 20 characters in the end that he did himself and it told him it would take 43 trillion years to crack so I'm guessing no one's going to attempt to hack his TT Rockstars account. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth the effort. But I ended up taking to the, uh, my PC and going, do you know what? You need to look at, after the many times that Russ told me about MFA, look at this. This is MFA. <laughs> this is this is how you know we add on an extra layer of security to it for me as an individual. So how easy is it to implement MFA for the individual? It's, it should be very easy. I think um, I think a lot of this does come down to mindset to a degree. Um, so we're all familiar with the idea that most of us have banking apps on our phones more yeah. often than not. And we're familiar that when we make a, a transaction that's either unusual or over a certain limit, we get a text message. We have to put a code in. Um, that is a form of MFA. It's actually okay. one of the more rubbish forms of MFA. But again, this, this is, comes back to where the, the kind of the wider business landscape needs to kind of keep up with 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 the kind of security trends and what's what's happening out there and it's it's very difficult because there's a lot of money that goes into the infrastructure and goes into changing said infrastructure um but in terms of how easy is it for people to to roll mfa out nine times out of ten it's baked into whatever they're using whatever um they've got amazon like online banking um Facebook, whatever, there will be an MFA setting under their settings. All they've got to do is flick it on and it's either going to be a text message or it'll be the um, the OTP, what's referred to as a one time passcode. Yeah. And for those of you who can't visualize that, that's the set of numbers that changes every sort of 30 to 60 seconds and puts you under pressure when it's only got so many seconds left. Can I can I get that code in? Um, it's part of the and, game now. <laughs> and that's it. But, but that's that's one of the things that's that's kind of how hard it should be. But those are quite clunky mechanisms, and I think they set a bad precedent. When I talk to, to business customers about um, MFA, um, you know, the, the common response I get is, yeah, that sounds great. I know we need it. I'm going to get earache from the staff because it's going to make their lives more difficult. And I always argue that the right MFA solution won't make their life more difficult, but it's just breaking down the uh, the perception, because again, their perception is going to be, I'm going to get a text, or I'm going to get this stupid code that's going to put me under pressure to, to put it in. If I miss it, I've got to do it again. It's, it's adding 30 seconds to logging into my machine, which is not the end of the world, but it will seem like it at the time because it's frustrating. Um, to be fair, we want to be able to get into an, an account just like almost immediately. We don't, the password is, is already a struggle for some. <laughs> and that's one of the, the interesting things is again, biometric gets touted about as being the answer, the password killer, and it's not. Behind the scenes, the, the biometric is just passing on the password. It, it's build, been built on top of it. You know, um, pretty much all of the infrastructure anywhere that requires some sort of secure communication has a password element to it. Um, all these other factors are, are layered on top to either make it more secure or try to make it more convenient for us. And, and biometrics is, is by far and away more of a convenience than a, than a security measure to a degree. Um, if you know your, well, if you don't don't know your password anyway, one of the, the good ways you can kind of get around certain things is never know your passwords. Always have random passwords for every account, and use biometrics as a as a means to authenticate. Again, you've got the convenience factor, you've got the strong password factor. But again, depending on on the amount of effort someone wants to put in, there's still ways around it. I mean, even MFA itself isn't perfect. Well, yes, a bit 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 more. An extra layer of security makes everything a bit more harder for, this, for the criminals, really. And that's it. It's all about layers. Secu security or defence in depth is kind of the term. <laughs> that's fair enough. I like that. I think this is something we should always be making sure we do, which is you know, changing our passwords as well. I'm guessing regular changing passwords is another thing that we should be. Well, you, you say seeing. that. Again, the, the advice seems to kind of differ. So that one of the, the things now is that if you've got a really long password, don't keep changing it. Um, I think one of the challenges with, with uh, frequent password changes is people will, will choose rubbish passwords or predictable passwords because it's, it, again, it's the aggravation factor. As human beings, we struggle 
with change and remembering stuff. I, I certainly do. So, you know, we'll have a nice strong password. And when it comes around to changing it again, we will set something with a few characters at the end that are a little bit different just to make it easy to remember for next time. Um, and that's yeah. okay. It, it's predictable and it's easier to break. If you've got 90% of a password, that last 10% is going to be damn so easy to get hold of, isn't it? Um, so, again, I, I would definitely encourage that people um, look at password managers um, rather than trying to remember long, complicated passwords. Um, it certainly cuts out the need to, to try and remember it. It cuts out the need to reuse passwords. You should never really reuse a password because if that one does get leaked out through one of these public breaches or something else, it leaves all your other accounts vulnerable. And that's one of the other things I think, I think people don't give enough consideration to is that online, even in the workplace, our email address is our identity. It's become yeah. our name and address, if you like, all in one hit. And we'll tend to use the same email address all over the place. So if I've got a list of usernames, email addresses and passwords, it's not going to take me long to work out how many other different accounts your email address may live on, how many other platforms, and I can retry those passwords and see if you've reused them and get in that way. I guess, yeah, because you, you, your identity is your email address, isn't it? it is, it's the main <coughs> account name or yeah, the username for most of your accounts. And therefore, yeah, if, you've, if you are using the same password, you, you're going to be really easy to hack after that. <laughs> yeah, that's where MFA no. kind of comes in. You know, it, it can help protect you if you do make the, the silly mistake of reusing a password. But again, it's still not perfect. So, two things. Don't reuse passwords on multiple accounts. Make them long passwords as well. And use password managers to support that. Set up MFA when you can as an additional layer. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would be the, the advice for, for anybody and everybody. Just just for general accounts. <laughs> so let's let's move on from there to keep with the individual. So. There are lots of news articles about phishing attacks at the moment, and. You know, we've seen that the Hack, Hackney Council has been attacked by ransomware, <laughs> how they managed to get into there. We've seen that Donald Trump has even had his own website account hacked. Let's yeah. not question what, what's gone on there either. But he threw down the gauntlet, didn't he, saying nobody gets hacked oh, he after he got yeah. hacked. But um, yeah, the universe realigned itself to, to fix that problem. <laughs> <laughs> but so a, a lot of it starts from, well, as I understand it, some sort of social engineering campaign, whether that's mm -hmm. a simple phishing email or something that's more targeted. And then that leads to bigger attacks. So this is more looking at what can the individual do to stop themselves being a target potentially, or even to recognise that they are being attacked. OK, it's um, I think we need to accept that we are all targets when it comes to phishing. Phishing, I think, accounts for 90 percent odd of how most kind of breaches start. And it's, it's one of those things where phishing is more of a psychological um, trick than a technological one. Technology obviously is, is helping to enable it, um, but at the end of the day, absolutely anybody can be fished with the right information, the right context and circumstance. Um, so I think be be mindful of communications. If you, you get an email out of the blue from someone you don't know or concerning something you don't really remember, don't click any links. If there's anything in that says click here to track your parcel or um, yeah, we, we, you missed your booking with British Gas or whatever, um, go to the website individually, break out a new tab, log yourself in as normal, use MFA, um, and then you should be able to follow the notifications in there. Most of these, these systems will have notifications in your account anyway, um, as well as the email or the text message they may send you. Never actually click on anything inside a link or any, or any links inside a message because you can't always be sure where that's come from. and I know one of the bits of advice used to be look out for the padlock and the green bar in the browser because yeah. that means it's secure. And it's it, it it is and it isn't. What it means is it's using a thing called HTTPS, which is a secure version of, of the web protocol. So the, the information you're exchanging from your machine to wherever you're going to is encrypted. Great. Well, I can get a free SSL certificate. Yeah. If it's Anybody. encrypted with a criminal, it's still encrypted and it's still secure. Exactly, yeah. Anyone can get an SSL certificate, anyone can set up a website, anyone can make a browser look like it's locked down. So um, just don't click on anything you get in a message. If you are 
um, if you do kind of again, we're, we're kind of task driven people. You know, we're, we're doing the kind of nine to five job and we're trying to to get from A to B. If we do click on a link and the page loads, don't do anything else. Never, never log anything in if it asks you to log in. You know, take a note of the URL. Sometimes, although the um, the address bar may be satisfied, this is a secure connection. The the address bar may look suspect. You know, PayPal is spelt with a four and things like yeah. <laughs> silly things like that. Um, and also make sure again, if you're an individual, um, close out of that browser, go log in fresh elsewhere into your account. Um, maybe change your password if you are really concerned that you may have may automatically signed you in if you've got your password stored in, in the browser and things like that. If you're an organization, a business, come speak to your IT department, let them know that something may have happened and they can investigate it. Yes, fair enough, really. I mean, there are, I, yeah, there are quite a lot of clever emails out there that just make you think for a second that you may have done something or to go click on a link. I think we I had an email from Curry's telling me I bought something. Please leave a, re leave a review. Mm. Weirdly, the product in question was very close to a product I had bought. I just hadn't bought it from Curry's. It just the timing of it was probably just by pure chance. That email probably went to thousands of people. I just happened to be ha happened to buy a product very similar at that very m that moment in time. OK, I didn't click on it because I knew I didn't buy for anything from Curry's. Mm. <laughs> but for a moment, it did have me like, did I did I buy it from Curry's? So I realised, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. That's a scam email. <laughs> so I guess even when we were trying to be helpful with reviews, we could potentially be logging, going to a web page, logging into an account and giving them all sorts of details. And information that they are they're after. Yeah, it, it, it kind of plays to people's vanity to a degree, and I, I think it's, it's quite a phenomenon of, of the internet. Is that everyone has a voice, and everyone likes to express that. Social media is littered with people just kind of spouting random um, thoughts in their head, and they're they're free to do so. But those sort of messages will play on stuff like that. Yeah, we we, we want want your feedback. We value your yeah. opinion. Click on this, and it. It may be one of one or two things that you'll get to the, the page and it'll have the oh to, to leave a review log in with either Facebook, Gmail, whichever a common account you use, and you'll click on one of the buttons and whenever you sign in with it, it'll be recording it in the background. Or they may ask you to create an account on their on their platform to let you leave the review. And again, you'll fall victim to the have I reused my password? You know, am I what, uh -huh. what personal information am I giving over? I was just an email address. Now I've given them my first name, my last name, possibly where I live, a telephone number, and all this information can actually help them craft a much more sophisticated attack later on, or just sell your data. I mean, that's one of the other things I think kind of goes um, under the radar is that your your identity in terms of personal details has a value. People sure. will buy up this stuff, bundle it together with more stuff they've gathered, then resell it themselves, or they may use it to commit fraud. Um, the whole kind of COVID thing was interesting. I think we, we've had it over here and definitely in the States. I know they've had people trying to register for um, kind of uh, benefits and things because they've, they've been furloughed from work and what have you. And they found that someone's already registered in their name and is claiming their benefits yeah. because they've literally nicked their identity. Well, you saying that there was a, a business in the UK that um, some criminals had claimed a loan in their, their a furlough, a, a business loan, a COVID loan in their name. Now they're being chased for the money hmm. when the repayment's coming up. And where you talk about, um, we were talking about social media. I don't know if you saw the Woolworths fake account the other day. So Ooh, uh, some, yeah, somebody's made a fake Wool UK Woolworths account saying Woolworths are coming back to the UK. Um, oh, we're coming up with a new there. site and tell us what what what's what do you want i mean it, it very dot com that owns the woolworths trademark and brand quite quickly said this isn't us but i think it was shared you know, four thousand times mm. you know where where it's going to go i'm not quite sure personally what how they'd use it but i can imagine you are now can connect to people you've got connections now you created connections you can probably then ask them questions, ask them to fill in forms. Or what sort of products would you like in your Woolworth store? And gather details, send them emails, and all of a sudden you can start a line of communication with you know, potentially 4,000 people. 
And that's it. Yeah, you might have had a million email addresses that you just fired this thing off to, and they then shared it themselves. And you've now hardened your your, your pool down. You've got um, a more concentrated set of targets to go and look at. Exactly. It's, it's things like that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, and the, the comical story where you're saying about sharing per, uh, you know, they sell personal information. Uh, over COVID period, they've been doing it as poker games instead. Mm, yeah, rat battles. Uh, in the dark favorite. web. I love the, the idea that, okay, terrible idea, but the idea of uh, play a game and you get personal identification information as part of your poker game. No mm. real money there, but information is being shared in more creative ways. But that information has a value. So yeah, yeah it's, it's collateral, isn't it? So they, they can put it on the table. Like they can put um, a set of car keys on the table. <laughs> well, they, they're not just, you know, PR, I think they were doing software information. And I just read earlier, it was um, flights had been bought for a holiday using somebody's personal a card. <laughs> they were selling a, a credit card in somebody's name. <laughs> that's been guaranteed for a year. Amazing. You're thinking, wow. The credit card thing, I, I can see them getting away with that. The flights, that'll be interesting. You, you turn up at, at Gatwick or Luton or wherever it is, and um, <laughs> clearly you're all over the CCTV, you're handing your passport over. Who's going to be brave enough to use those tickets? Well, who knows? <laughs> but, they, oh, you run it as, you take the flights and you run it as a competition on Facebook. Uh, possibly again, yeah, you, you've now got... Um, your own little marketing employer will give you this and we'll just just give us some details you know you can yeah, trust that. and you give them you give them real